Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Skerko, the Director of Conference and Events for CAINJ. We'd like to welcome all attendees and thank our partners, the Board of Directors, and the team today for today's program. Before we begin, I just want to run through a few of our upcoming events. Tomorrow, the Business Partners Committee will be hosting a virtual networking event at 4 p.m., limited to only business partners. Registration is still open. This Friday, we'll be hosting a round of HOA feud at 2 p.m. Beginning this Monday, October 5th, the CAI NJ Virtual Trade Show will release its first category of videos, starting with our engineering members. Please take the time to watch the videos and support our amazing membership. And be sure to join us every Wednesday for the Wednesday webinar series. And just a few housekeeping rules. All participants will be muted throughout. If you have a question, please type it into the question box and please be sure to state the panelists you would like the questions directed to. If you do need a certificate for manager credit, please email me at Jacqueline, J-A-C-L-Y-N, at C-A-I-N-J dot org. And just a side note, you must be in attendance, in attendance for the entire presentation to qualify for a certificate. I would now like to introduce Amy Shorter from our membership committee. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Amy Shorter and I'm from Pure Clean Restoration Services. I'm a proud member of CAI membership committee and I wanted to open up this event um, to talk to you first about reminding you that if you haven't renewed your membership, that now is the time to do so. Also, for all of those in attendance that are new with us, I'm gonna go over a little bit of the benefits of why you should become a member with us. So if you're a homeowner leader, CIM members have access to ADR programs, which is a very cost efficient way to fulfill your association's legal obligations. So our best communities have the best boards. They're educated and knowledgeable and prepared to lead their communities successfully. Help your board succeed by joining us. CAI New Jersey provides a robust library of content for community leaders, as well as ongoing virtual learning opportunities. Access to industry leaders, such as accountants, engineers, insurance, and legal services. And not to mention that if you have three to five board members and key volunteers added at one low price. So stay tuned, there's a lot more information um, provided on our website about some of the great roundtable programs that we have coming up in November. If you're a manager or in a management company, the benefits to becoming a member or being a member is access to online print directories of all the different industry leaders to help you navigate through these unparalleled times. And you can also earn your educational credits at a free or discount rate. And we also have this wonderful 2020 virtual trade show video catalog that will have, help you navigate to all of our top industry professionals. Lastly, business partners. You want to continue to build your brand, and you can do that with the help of CAI. It's a platform such as Zoom and seminars and education support that continue to give you value with your membership. And we're very lucky to have Jackie highlight some of the great things like um, Thursday, our happy hour, and also Friday, our business partners and HOA feud. So, not to miss out too on our 2020 viral trade show where your company could be featured on our website for up to six months. Um, as always, we absolutely love to assist you with your goals for CAI. We think there's so much value here and we want to continue to give you some really great programs. So I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator. Jackie, back to you. Thanks so much, Amy. Our first spe speaker today is Matthew Collins of Stark and Stark. Matthew counsels community associations in nearly all facets of their operations and risk management. The services that he provides to community associations includes interpretation, amendment and enforcement of go governing documents, collection of assessments, drafting and review of contracts, transition from declarant to unit owner control, loan documentation, board governance, and statutory compliance. Matthew? Thanks, thank you. I'd like to say, you know, we handle um, the large scale complex construction litigation to the, I can't believe I went to law school for this. I need to practice in the mirror before I get in front of the judge. Um, I think that was what I had to do uh, to argue of, uh, 
about taking someone's shrine to their dead cat that they built um, out on their patio. That was the latest mirror practice. Uh, so today I'm gonna focus my talk on conflicts of interest. And if time allows, I would like to uh, discuss uh, code of conduct. Code of conduct is a, a document that you can use to help guide your community through issues that may touch upon conflicts of interest. And I'll repeat this probably two more times, but when you're dealing with conflicts of interest, I advise my clients to follow the four Ds. And that's, um, after doing this for a while, that seems to be the easiest way to um, let this process sink in. And <clears throat> the four Ds are disclose, discuss, deliberate, and document. Now, a conflict of interest arises in the association context would be if a director, for example, sits on both sides of the transaction in one way, shape, or form. Uh, either the director is has a business or a family relationship with a vendor that the association is considering doing business with. Another conflict may arise where the relationship that the executive uh, board member has or the trustee has would somehow cloud or perhaps impact his or her judgment. Now, a lot of people think, as soon as they hear the word conflict of interest, they think, whoa, stop, we can't move forward, this is bad, move on to the next topic. And that's not always the case. Again, as long as you follow those four Ds, you can certainly deal with a conflict of interest without getting into trouble. Unfortunately, governing documents, um, I've, I've yet to see one that has been drafted by a developer or the sponsor that actually outlines what to do in a conflict of interest situation. As you know, board members have a lot of on-the-job training. Uh, many communities don't have an onboarding process. Uh, if, you know, some are fortunate enough to avail themselves to CAI and some of the great training programs that CAI has, but not everybody does. Uh, these are volunteer positions. They're busy and they're learning as they're going. And the governing documents, well, they can provide certain instruction and guidelines. The law can do the same. You're not getting a lot of instruction on how to deal with a conflict of interest. So what I'm gonna focus on today would just be what the New Jersey nonprofit corporation law sets forth concerning conflicts of interest. And there are really three things you need to do according to the nonprofit law in order to avoid getting into trouble with a conflict of interest situation. Perhaps the most important is the disclosure of the conflict. That's where I see board members getting into serious trouble uh, down the road if they fail to disclose that tri the, uh, the conflict of interest. And this could get into personal liability in some situations, depending upon the nature of that conflict. So in order to pass the, the test, so to speak, in New Jersey, um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read this because I don't wanna get this wrong. Uh, the interest of the board member must be disclosed or known to the board. The contractor transaction must be fair and reasonable at the time it was entered into. And a majority of the disinterested board members must vote to approve the transaction. Now, this is a, a minimum standard. You, know, you can have, you can add on to this, and I often suggest that you do because just as important as following the letter of the law or you know, a close second is the appearance of impropriety and avoiding that appearance of impropriety. And we've all heard that concept, perception is reality. So you wanna, I often advise my clients to take some extra steps to avoid, again, just even that appearance of impropriety. And the other thing too, a lot of your owners that aren't on the board, you know, that come to meetings, um, 
many of them don't understand the nuances of conflicts of interest, meaning that a conflict can be fine as long as, again, you follow those four Ds. Many people, when I'm talking to uh, communities about this, they think, whoa, as soon as there's a conflict, we got a problem and you have to move on. And in some cases, maybe that is the case. Maybe the optics just um, are too much of a challenge for your community. And even though it's a decent transaction, you may have you may have to pass on it. Um, so getting back to those um, four Ds, uh, the first one that I put in there was disclosure. And this is something that as a manager, you really need to drill into your board members. You have to disclose it, even if it's um, not a what they would think would be a direct conflict, even if it's a could be a perceived conflict, just let everybody know about it. There's no harm in doing that. And once <clears throat> the board member discloses it, the second D is discussion. The board members need to understand the circumstances of that transaction, of the not only the conflict, but again, you need to make sure that if you are going to enter into an arrangement or a transaction like this, it needs to be fair and reasonable for the association at the time. So if your community doesn't go through the process of getting multiple bids, which it should anyway, this is definitely a situation where if you're looking at a transaction involving a board member, a board member's family member, or a board member's business, or a board member's business partner, shop that around. Uh, you're not going to do yourself a disservice. Yeah, it may delay the process, but you definitely want to shop this around. And again, you can find some very good transactions involving board members. Um, I've had a situation where there was a board member who owned a landscaping company, and he, um, his company did a bang-up job and gave them a, a cut rate, and no other landscaping company could come close uh, to those numbers. So it can it can work on occasion. So after that discussion process, again, where the board is understanding every detail about that transaction, now we get to the third D, which is the deliberation process. Now the the law does not require this, but I counsel my clients to do this. The interested board member, I counsel my clients that they should recuse themselves from deliberating, discussing, and, and being present for the decision of whether or not to enter into this process. You want to make this as you know, independent as possible when the board goes through this analysis. And make sure that you are documenting the fact that this board member is recusing herself from that part of the process there. And then lastly, the fourth D here is to document. Now, if you go through this, this great process here, but you don't document it, well, it's, a, it's gonna be a problem because, or it could be a problem rather, most challenges to a transaction involving an interested board member are after the fact. You're not getting these challenges many times in real time. And some board members, their attention spans are greater than others. Their memories are, are greater than other uh, board members. Document it while it's fresh in everyone's mind. And that way, when there is a challenge down the road, you can pull this out and say, look, we followed the four Ds that this guy Collins told us about you know, a few months ago. And lo and behold, it, it also um, complies with the nonprofit law. And in fact, it goes a little step further because this board member recused herself from the critical process, which was a deliberation in the, the ultimate decision. Now, um, after you go through that process, that board is now kind of trained, right? They, they, they kind of know what to do and how to do it. And that manager at the time understands that process. But how do you sustain this? You know, we know there's, there's turnover, <coughs> excuse me, turnover at the board level, and there's also turnover with the manager. 
and when you get that turnover, unless that process is documented in writing, you're losing some of that institutional knowledge. Now, one way to do this, as I, as I counsel my clients, is come up with a conflict of interest policy. Don't rely on an ad hoc process and don't rely on institutional memory. And it looks like I will have time to get into this. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about today were codes of conduct. Now, a code of conduct, um, you'll find if you talk to different attorneys, there's uh, differences of opinion as to their effectiveness. Most of uh, my colleagues, and even my competitors, we seem to agree that they are a worthwhile document. Um, these documents will discuss decorum, you know, at the board level. They'll provide, you know, meaning how do you engage with one another. These codes of conduct can also serve, as I mentioned before, there's not a whole lot of training that these board members receive. Um, again, if they don't avail themselves to the, the classes and resources of uh, CAI, and I know the managers do a great job of, of training board members, but again, it's not like they're going to class. So this document could, could serve a secondary function of providing some onboarding training, some do's and don'ts. You'd be surprised how many board members don't understand what confidentiality really means. You'd be surprised uh, that some board members don't understand what is uh, to be confidential. And they don't understand that divulging some of these confidences have legal consequences. The, the easy one would be liability under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. If you're talking about someone's debt uh, who is outside uh, the board or not uh, council you know, or management, this can be baked in to your, to your code of conduct. And also, I think it's very prudent when you're dealing putting a code of conduct together to <clears throat> agree upon the, a conflict of interest policy. And not only the, will this policy outline the process, when, whatever process you choose, some people may wanna just stick to whatever the statute is within their jurisdiction. They may wanna add a, some additional protections. Again, as, as I said before, optics can be just as important as complying with the law. Your job as a manager, uh, the jobs as a board member are difficult enough. And um, you know you don't need to deal with the added suspicion surrounding those type of transactions. So bake that into your code of conduct, not only the process, but what is a conflict? When should you be disclosing this? Again, the most important of the four Ds is disclosure. And hopefully this document can be sort of passed down to board to board from manager to manager and polished along the way. You know, it's, it can be a quote living document that again gets updated and to the times and adapts as needed to the situation. One, one thing I'll leave it, I think I have a few seconds left. The question will come up, well, should we do this as a uh, should this be incorporated in the bylaws or something more potent than a resolution? And my answer often is no. Um, even though it's not going to have the same bite as something in the bylaws or something in the rules and regulations, it's so hard for many communities to get the consensus needed to pass those type of amendments that a resolution would be sufficient to provide the guidance that you're that your board and that your community and that your manager needs uh, to assist in those situations. I think right. I wrapped up before my time, Alama Jack. How about that? Good, good. You're a minute early, but thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So we do have a couple questions, uh, Matthew. I know you touched on this a bit, um, but what what about conflicts of interest with unit owners? They're saying, for example, like you said, with the landscaping company, um, could an association hire a landscaping company owned by a unit owner? Right, and so you don't have the legal issues surrounding that that you do with a board member you know, who has a fiduciary duty to the association. It's really the optics and what could be the awkwardness of that. I, I kind of uh, equate that to um, romantic relationships at the office. You know, like 
there's nothing wrong with it, but you could create some problems and awkwardness down the road. And so really look at that hard. I, I tend to guide my boards away from those transactions just because you can really cause some significant awkwardness. I think the size of your community could help as well or could could influence that decision. Okay, and another question that came through, what are some consequences for board members who don't disclose their conflict of interest? The, well, there was a case not too long ago in Arizona uh, where there was a board member who didn't disclose it and I'll try to get that site to you. Um, I'll have that site before we wrap up today. It is a roadmap of, of what you shouldn't do when you're faced with a conflict of interest. And ultimately this, this gentleman had, had personal liability uh, for pretty serious dollars. So that would be probably the most extreme consequence that could occur would be the, um, that board member could face some individual liability, but also the transaction could be, uh, could be undone and the association can face some consequences down the road too if that transaction is, is invalidated they could have recourse then against that um against that director who did not disclose his his uh, conflict all right well thank you matthew that's all i have for right now but if anybody has any further questions for matthew please enter them in our questions box and we'll come back at the end to ask any additional questions thank you all right, uh, the, our next presenter is Deborah Borzillo. She has been the office manager for Lemus Construction for the past 11 years. Deborah is actively involved in all aspects of the commercial and multifamily projects. Deborah and her, Deborah and her team work in-house and in hand in hand with Victor Lemus and Mario Aguilar to help ensure every project runs smoothly. Deborah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, well, thank you, Jackie. We appreciate the opportunity. I hope everyone is well. Um, I have a, a short presentation that I would like to show. Um, I'm gonna be discussing roofs, roof installation, roof maintenance, things of that sort. So I think this will help um, um, demonstrate. So sometimes it's better to have a visual. Um, most roofing companies are take over the full gamut of uh, roofing, siding, windows, the whole envelope of the uh, structure. So as you can see, there's many components that are uh, contained within the actual envelope. So you have the shingles, which could be many types, whether there's asphalt shingles, there's cedar, there's standing seam metal. Um, you might have a roof, a flat roof uh, that might need EPDM or TPO, uh, and then roof coatings. Another thing that is um, very critical would be gutters. It's important that you have good gutters that are um, um, able to can, uh, direct the water flow from the, the roof away from the house, away from the foundation. Um, they, we basically are installing 6K gutters with three by four downspouts. It's, um, while some people may think that that's a larger uh, look on a, on a property, it really is not that much bigger. And it does a very nice job with directing the water flow away from the property, the foundation. And as we've seen this year, last year, uh, the rains that we've had, uh, they're torrential at times. So there's a lot of water that comes off of that roof uh, very quickly. Um, so with any roofing company, I'm sure uh, like ours, we have uh, many different divisions. We have one that is just basically for residential and you deal with the individual homeowners. Service is a very important part uh, that goes into the multifamily and commercial division. There's always some sort of maintenance that needs to be done. Um, whether it's someone calls up and says they have a roof leak, if they just need their gutters cleaned and so forth. And then of course, there's the residential and the multifamily divisions, which I'm basically talking to you about today. So when you have a roof project, what should you expect? Well, it's a messy job and it's a loud job. 
Um, most people only go through it once in a lifetime. So it's our job to help assist you and your board to educate the homeowners and try to uh, help them through the process. Um, at this time with COVID, it's a little more challenging because the majority of the people are stuck in their homes and they're not going out to work and they hear all this noise and confusion, so to speak, outside. Um, and it can be quite challenging for both the homeowner, the property manager and the contractor. So with any component on the, on the roof, you can see that you have um, the decking over here. So once the roof is ripped, we inspect the decking. And that's the time where it's critical to make sure that whether you have rotted plywood, delaminated plywood, um, water, water uh, stained plywood, that that's when you want to replace it. So a lot of that is an unknown cost to the board prior to signing a contract, because as I said, it's covered with all the roof components. You can kind of get a feel if the majority of the plywood is bad from the initial inspection when the inspector is walking the roof. They can, they can feel the softness um, under, under their feet to know that, oh, you know, this, this section, it feels pretty shaky. So um, pricing can be adjusted accordingly, but the, the majority of it is not really fully known until the project is done. The flashings are very important in the corners, as you can see here, wherever the uh, roof may meet a sidewall, you, it's a very critical area for water infiltration. So you wanna make sure that you have the proper flashings and underlayment in that spot. Um, then we would go down and put the underlayment on, as you see, the ISOM water shield, and um, then we start installing the roof. So there's many components with, within the roof system, whether you have dryer vents that extend out through the roof, uh, attic, fan, uh, attic fans, the, um, the skylights, and uh, the bathroom exhaust uh, protrusions. Um, right now, I wanna show you just a short video from GAF. Um, and it, it really explains, and you can hear how a roof is being put on. Okay, so now that we've seen that, um, that video, it helps give you a visual to better understand the entire process. Um, the, the attic um, has many protrusions in it. You have bathroom exhaust pipes that, that come out through that. You might have your stack pipes for your plumbing. 
Um, you also might have drier vents. Some of them go out through the sidewalls. Some of them go out through the roof. So it's important to make sure that you have the, um, the airflow in the attic. Um, so take an example of the bathroom. Now, code today, years ago it wasn't like this, but code today is that that bathroom exhaust must vent out through the roof. So there's many communities that we're working in that we find that they just stop right inside the attic. And that can cause many, many problems uh, if it's not taken care of. Most of which would be the obvious, which is putting moisture into that attic space when you turn your exhaust fan on when you're getting a shower. You don't want all that moisture to collect inside your attic. It can give you a lot of condensation issues that sometimes may appear to the homeowner to be a roof leak. But when in actuality, when you actually get up into the roof, I mean, into the attic, excuse me, to inspect, you can see uh, the nails sometimes are rusted. Sometimes there's even water droplets that fall from those nail heads inside the attic. So while you can have a great roof system on the outside, the ventilation inside the attic is also just as important. Um, you can see in this diagram right here, how it's showing the insulation in the attic. Insulation is another component that helps keep the roof system working properly. So when you install insulation, you wanna make sure that down in this area, you're installing baffles so that you keep the soffits open and the insulation doesn't cover those vents and you're gonna have your, your airflow coming in from your soffit going out through your ridge vent. The ridge vent is a great system where, let me show you this screen. So if you see these pink styrofoam um, uh, components here, they are the baffles. And you can see how they only are installed to a certain depth to allow for the soffits to remain open. So your airflow comes in, travels over this, and goes up and out through the roof, through the ridge vent. When doing shingles, we also, also run across um, some fascia boards that need to be replaced. This is a pretty extreme example of a pretty damaged fascia board. So you would want to make sure that if gutters were not a component that were included in the roofing aspect, you would wanna bring this to the attention of the property manager so that they're aware that that really does need to be replaced. You cannot install gutters back on this because they're eventually just gonna, that's just gonna continue to rot and they'll fall off. So you need to make sure that all of those under pieces that are not seen to the naked eye are just as strong as the roof system that you're putting on. As I spoke to you in the beginning about the plywood, um, this is an example on the left side of your screen where you can see that the lower portion here looks like pretty much all of it needed to be replaced. They're working on the upper part here. So on the left side, it's showing the FRT plywood, which is your fire treated, um, fire resistant treated plywood. This is especially important when you um, are working around firewalls where two units abut each other and they, that um, FRT plywood needs to be installed four feet from the abutting wall. So the most common is a Drycon fire retardant treated wood. Um, it has an unmatched record of protection against flames that spread, smoke development, rot, and decay. It was first introduced in 1981, and it's a really um, important tool, um, component, not tool, a component to have to 
if in the worst case scenario, a fire were to break out on one side of the unit, um, that has a certain time factor, which allows the residents on the other side to get out before the fire actually affects their unit. Um, warranties, there are many kinds of warranties that you can get when you're looking to replace your roof system. Um, GAF has a um, golden pledge warranty, which is really second to none. So as you can see on this side, then this column, um, well, let me start with this. So for, for a roofing company, there's always things that are going to be included for a certain time frame. Then you wanna go and look to see what kind of warranty would best serve your community's purposes. Now, of course, it does depend on how much a reserve fund that you have and what you can financially afford to do. Um, the, gold, the System Plus is an excellent warranty that comes standard with all of the roof systems that, GA, that we install for GAF. However, to, if you would like to upgrade, GAF has what they call a Golden Pledge warranty. Now, I'm not just promoting GAF. Every roof company, every roof manufacturer has their own warranties. Um, so whether it's GAF or, or a certain TEED or Owens Corning, um, they're all very good systems. We do work, however, primarily with a GAF roof system. We like this Golden Pledge warranty because for the first 40 years, the cost of insulation for the labor is included. Um, for the uh, workmanship, they are covered. It runs consecutively with, if you can see here, it would run consecutively. Uh, the co roofing contractor would cover it for the first five years. But then GAF, if you have this up warranty, uh, covers it for 20 years. So obviously, if something were to happen in the first five years, you would always go back to your contractor before you would fall back on the warranty. Um, Deborah, they have, I just have, yes. Uh, if we could just get to um, your, your recap a little bit, we are running out of time for the presentation. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, no so with, a, with, a, um, with an association key, Communication is key. Um, whether we are fortunate enough to be uh, in front of the, um, the community um, to help them understand the whole process, put a face with a name of a company, um, it makes them feel like they're more included in the whole process. Um, we also, um, it's very important that you have trained, knowledgeable employees so we make sure that there's um, uh, OSHA training and safety meetings all the time. Um, for the property manager, it's good to give them a construction schedule. We, uh, you would put, you know, whichever units you're gonna do for a certain time period, and then just run it out through the length of the project. It helps them when uh, someone says, oh, when's my roof gonna be done? <laughs> um, Care, it's good for your contractor to take care for the exterior when doing a project. You wanna make sure that things are covered and uh, do your best to try not to uh, cause any damage uh, to anyone's personal belongings. And in the end, you're left with a beautiful roof system, as you see, um, with components that are all well matched and you have happy homeowners because their roofs are not leaking anymore. So if you um, have any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer them. Great. So I think you touched on this a little bit, but we have a question saying, what is your opinion on placing insulation on the ceiling of an attic? Is insulation in this location recommended or not? No, that's a very good question. Uh, and most people think that that would be the place to put it. But actually, what you're doing is you're preventing the plywood from breathing. So you wanna make sure that that insulation is, is put on the floor of the attic. Um, that's where it's going to keep any of the heat and or air from inside the unit from escaping out into the attic and then obviously out into the air. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question. 
what are the benefits of a roof inspection? I'm sorry, what are the benefits of a roof inspection have in determining when an association should replace their roofs? Um, that's a great question. So sometimes uh, it's good for budgetary purposes and a, a roof inspection can cover a whole gamut of things. Number one, if the board is just trying to determine how much a reserve fund that they're going to need for a project in say five years, that roof inspection is very important because you can uh, see if there's any missing shingles, if you have nail pops that are sticking up, um, any sort of little maintenance issues that could be taken care of that could help extend the life of the roof until they are actually financially ready to take on that process. Great, thank you. And that's all the questions I have right now. Again, if anybody would like to ask more questions, please feel free to put them in the question box. And we are gonna move on to our final presenter. Elaine Wargamurray is the CEO and owner of RMG Regency Management Group. She was the first woman, woman in New Jersey to receive the PCAM designation. Elaine has been voted Speaker of the Year three times in New Jersey and is a National and CAI NJ Hall of Fame recipient. Elaine is a National CAI faculty member and national expert witness. Welcome, Elaine, thank you. Thanks. Okay, guys, those are two hard, shows to follow but i'll do my best i'm going to be talking about customer service the one bane of our existence keeping our customers happy we can give them all the information in the world but certainly keeping them happy and satisfied is a challenge during these times with more people being home and spending more time looking at their environment we get way more emails way more calls and way more text from homeowners and I would say that our workload has exponentially in, increased during the pandemic because of the amount of interaction that homeowners who are home want to engage in. In talking about customer service, and I've been doing this for 30 years and uh, that has not changed. Customers are demanding and I believe they have a right to be demanding because quite frankly, they need to be treated the way I want to be treated. And that's primarily how I address customer service with my staffing, because I tell them that customer service is not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for customer satisfaction. And in order to have customer satisfaction, we have to not only just respond, we have to understand what they want us to do. One of the things that I've developed in developing training in-house is to give scripts to all of my professionals, whether they be in accounting or whether they be in property management or office processing. And the scripts usually follow a standardized, thank you for calling. We're very happy to receive your phone call. Always thank people for calling or thank them for their email. Because if they don't contact us, then they're stewing or getting angrier. So I always say, thank them. Then if you get a homeowner who's calling up to complain or who's calling up and is upset, the thing you have to do is to assure that customer that you understand. So our standard, and I'm gonna read you some of our, our standard script lines. When something is happening in the community, be sure to use a one call so that everybody knows what's going on. And one call will either be a, a phone call or an email or a text, letting people know that the fire hydrants are gonna be clean this week, or there's a roofing project coming up, or there's a board meeting coming up. Now, when a person calls is upset, the first thing you have to say is, I understand. I understand that you're upset. I would like to understand why you're upset or better understand why you're upset. And if you could just help me understand why you're upset, I will be able to help you better. So that's one script uh, sentence that we have. Another one is, I would, I would be as upset as you if I were in that situation. What would you like me to do for you? And then you ask them that question, and say, I would like to understand what your expectation is. Because if you don't understand their expectation, you can't answer them in a way that's going to make them satisfied. After they explain to you what you can do for them, our next script says, 
okay, now that I hear what you want me to do for you, I will double check and see if we can accommodate that request and if I can make that happen. Not always are we able to do exactly what they want. If we're able to give them a response right then and there, we can say typically, okay, I understand you have a roof leak and your roof is under warranty and we will go back to the contractor and see if we can get them to respond within the next day or so. However, we don't know that we can replace the entire roof. Even though homeowners will say, I want a new roof. Even though they just have a small leak, they may say, I want a new roof. So we basically try and mitigate how we can respond by saying that we will depend on what the contractor or what the vendor can provide and then get back to them. Having a script is, is important. The other thing that we, we always say to homeowners when they call is, I appreciate you calling me and I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, but if you put your complaint in email, we have, a, we have a record of it and you have a record of it. That way we can properly document that we have the appropriate issues that you want us to address. I may misunderstand something, so I'm going to send you a, a email following our conversation to kind of summarize what I think we talked about. If you have a different opinion, please get back to me via email. The other thing is always say that you're going to bring something to the board's attention because most homeowners who call management companies always complain that they're not getting their information to the board. What, one reason that they think that is that we want to keep things hidden from the board, but of course we don't. Uh, the kind of reporting that we do is always mentioned to homeowners who call within the play. We make sure they understand that a work ticket will be generated from this call and a work check ticket will be generated to you as, as well as on the report to the board. So you will be able to see that we are in fact documenting your complaint, making sure it goes to the board and making sure that the response of what work is being done to resolve this issue is also documented. And I appreciate the, the comments that Matt made about the discussion, document, and disclose, because those things apply to everything that we do in property management. We have to disclose everything that we do. We have to document everything that we do. And we need to discuss everything we do with the board at a board meeting. So that's a good thing to remind people of that those four Ds, which I left one out, but those, those three are the most important as it relates to property management, is what we try and get people to understand that we need to do those three things and their help is appreciated. I'm gonna look at my notes here for a second to see if there's anything else that, um, that we tell them um, in terms of a script. One area that we do mention in addition to our script is saying that, this is not a new problem for your home. We have a work ticket system that will give us history on every unit. So when a person calls, one of the first things that we do in the office is pull up their account. And by looking at their account, we can see what work tickets have actually been submitted for that particular unit in the past and how they were handled. For example, uh, right now I'm doing a, uh, a, a, a consult for a homeowner who had roof leaks over the course of four years. And each time they had a roof leak, it was for a different reason. Now the homeowner is very frustrated because they're saying, well, I've had this roof leak for four years and no one fixes it. If you can look at their work ticket history, you can say, listen, we have a work ticket from 2019. And that was because of missing shingles. Then we have another work ticket that came this earlier this year in, in, in 2020, and that was related to a condensate pump, a condensate, condensation pump. And that's a different issue. We didn't realize that when we did the first repair. Now we have a, a third re report of a roof leak, and we need to find out what's causing the roof leak, because it may not be the same two issues that caused the roof leak in 2020, earlier 2020, and in 2019. So knowing what those past 
work tickets are is important in being able to discuss and respond to homeowners and make sure that they understand that we're aware of their dilemma. Because most homeowners think that th that they can fudge, <laughs> that no one did what they were supposed to do. And we won't know that. We'll just say, oh, really? No one did what they were supposed to do? If we don't have the documentation of how each one of those work tickets was addressed, we obviously cannot respond appropriately. Occasionally, it may be possible to set up a Zoom meeting. And we've done that with individual homeowners so that the resident complaining about the same issue can actually see their work tickets because we can put them up on the screen and then we can go over them with them. And that's been actually very effective. I would say that um, email and, and attaching photographs of and screenshots of the work tickets has also been extremely effective. So my basic premise about customer service and customer satisfaction is to treat my clients the way I want to be treated. And the way I want to be treated is I want to be considered to be smart and not adult. And so if someone respects me when they speak to me, that's important. And then the other thing is that I would like to have factual information. And if you can factually identify what you're going to do, what has been done, and how the homeowner will be communicated the fact of what's going to be done, I think that that's, that's meeting their expectations. Now, granted, we can't make everybody happy all the time. And unfortunately, that's just a reality. All we can do is thank them for letting us respond. So that's one of our closing, our, our closing script comments. I wanna thank you for letting me have the opportunity to discuss this with you. We also put that in our emails. I, I can't say thank you enough to my clients because my clients have to be appreciated because without the clients, I don't have a job. <laughs> And so every time they want us to do something for them, that means that we have a job. And so every time you get an email or a text or a homeowner call, it's something you should be happy about because it means that they A, need us, A, want us to respond, and B, are giving us an opportunity to respond. So customer satisfaction is basically letting people know that you're going to treat them the way you want to be treated if they, you were in their in their circumstances. I think that um, customer satisfaction can be helped by doing annual surveys, but I like to do personal surveys better. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, when you talk to Verizon or you talk to the cable company, you will get an email or a text and it will say, how did you like your conversation. How well did you appreciate what was done? Did the person who you talked to handle your handle your 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 issue appropriately? Were you happy with it? And I think that's more effective. I think it's more effective to follow up every phone call and every email with another email that says, "Were you satisfied with the response you received from Clarissa or Mary or Susan or whomever it was that helped, helped that individual. Because that I think is what's important. Sending out a blanket survey may be effective for 20% of the people, but if you actually do it one-on-one -on -one each time you have an interaction, you're going to get a more realistic and a more appropriate way to get back to your to your board. I like it when my board members have an opportunity to see that eight out of 10 homeowners were pleased with the response they got. When they see the two homeowners who weren't pleased, we have to be able to address why they weren't pleased. And I believe again in disclosing that to the board members so they're not taken blindsided. How many people have been at board meetings and we've sitting there and doing something and all of a sudden someone raised their hand and they said, I'm really unhappy. I had a work ticket and nothing was done. And then without that information, the board is, is now blindsided. So it's important that we give the information to the homeowners so that they can also gauge what kind of satisfaction the homeowner is expecting as well as what 
work the property manager did to respond to their to their issue. I would think it would be a good idea now to maybe go to questions if there are any. I don't know, are there questions about customer satisfaction? Yeah, yep, we do have some stuff. Um, first, we actually just have a comment saying, Elaine, I agree completely with documenting everything. This is why our file cabinets and network drives are so full. <laughs> All right, um, so our first question says, COVID has created a very difficult climate with thousands of homeowners home full time. I would like to hear your feedback on how you deal with a notably difficult person that communicates with continual rudeness, screams, and also sends emails that reflect the same. Oh, you mean we have people who are rude? I can't believe it. I don't think they mean to be rude. And that's what I tell all of my, my professionals. They don't, they don't mean to be rude. They're upset. So you have to acknowledge that they're upset. You then have to be sure to say, listen, I, I have no problem helping you, but I, I need you to calm down so that we can I can better I can better understand. Never use the term you when you're talking to a, a complainer. I understand that I need to help you. I want to help you and I want to do something that will resolve this for you. I need you to calm down so that I can understand better how I can help you. So that's the first thing. Always ask them to please calm down so that you can properly help them. Again, don't chastise them and don't complain to them. I know we all have the issue of people using profanity. Well, you know, in this day and age, people use profanity a lot, a lot. <laughs> and I would appreciate it if, if we could reduce the level of profanity. That's what I suggest. Not you're, you're profane and I can't talk to you anymore. I always say, listen, could we reduce the, the amount of pro profanity so that we can actually get to the heart of the matter and resolve your problem? All right, great. Uh, we have another question. How do you help managers from getting burnt out with all of the calls and extra work these times are creating? I let them wear whatever they want. I know that some schools have told kids that they can't wear pajamas. I tell my staff, if you want to wear pajamas, wear pajamas. I would rather that you wear pajamas and do your work and respond to your clients than get dressed up like I am right now. Because I, you know, I figured that since you're recording this, I should probably not wear my pajamas. So I let them wear whatever they want. And of course, when we were closed, they could wear their pajamas to work because nobody ever showed up. You know, we, we, we had the door locked and we only had a few people in the office at a time and that helped them. Another thing is, is that I am very concerned about work-life balance. And I actually have a work-life balance consultant who comes in and speaks to my staff. And actually one of the people who I've used in the past is my daughter. My daughter is a neuroscience psych psychologist. And one of the things that she deals with aside from actually doing clinical research and, and, and dealing with the neuroscience and psychological aspects of being a doctor in the hospital is to make sure people understand that our own health is what's important and we need to take rest. In fact, one of the rules I have in my office is that everyone must, must take two breaks in the morning and two breaks in the afternoon because they will stay there and just work, 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 work. I know that's, that sounds like hard to believe, but that's what happens. They get, they get tied up and they start working. So we basically have these little things. Did you take a break? Did you take a break this morning? You know, would you like to take a break now? And then of course I do a lot of, of skill assistance. One of the issues with managers getting burnt out is that they're constantly uh, placed in a position where they don't have enough information. And what I try and do is be personally available. Whenever I have a manager who is getting a little bit anxious and is feeling a little bit upset, I tell them, please just call me or meet with me or talk to me or email me and let me know what it is that's frustrating you or what it is that you're upset about because I can probably talk you off the edge. I mean, I've been on the edge enough times myself that I pretty much understand why managers have to be talked back off the ledge. 
fortunately for me, I have a great longevity of staff. I have people who have been with me for 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, seven years, and five years. So that longevity speaks to the satisfaction that hopefully my, my staff and personnel are able, my team members are able to enjoy. All right, we have one more, it looks like. What are some of the most successful strategies used to increase customer satisfaction? For me, in the, all the time that I hear from clients, and this is interesting, is they need something tactile. One of the things that we do for, for all homeowners, aside from giving them an, a, an email, is send postcards. Postcards tactile. Now we all hate our mail, but the truth is, if we will all turn over a postcard, we may not open a letter, but we will turn over a postcard. So giving people a tactile example and a tactile proof that something occurred is, I think, one of the most successful strategies because you know, just the fact that you talk, how many times have we heard? Well, I returned their call and I left a message. Not good enough not good enough because the message could be lost, it could be missed, but a postcard or an email is a tactile, something you can hang your hat on and hold in your hand and say, this is proof that we did respond to you. All right, well, that is all the questions that I have for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elaine, Deborah, and Matthew for speaking with us today and for everybody who joined us. Again, if you do need a certificate, please email me at Jacqueline at CAINJ.org. And we look forward to seeing you all next week on our Wednesday webinar. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.